Okay, so I, I think I got the, the setup mostly working. Um, okay, so what I was thinking for the session is I basically want to, you know, so you, you guys, you guys all care the most about 3D printing. So this is your toy for the next week. Um, so I'm going to leave this here set up day and night. We can test out different things. We can print. Um, you can borrow my laptop or I can get you the right software to, to try different models and stuff. And um, this is a great way to get first-hand experience with a 3D printer without actually investing in one. And then by the end of the week, you're going to want one of your own anyway. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize in advance for the, um, the very important business expense that you're going to make <laughs> towards your, um, your future. What's the? Ah, oh, how much? Um, so this particular 3D printer which I, I am somewhat biased towards, but I'll, I'll tell you why. I think it, it sets you back about 2,000 euros, approximately. Um, and if, if you're like more of like a do-it-yourselfer, they actually have the Ultimaker Original, which in some ways is actually slightly better than this printer. And I think it's around 1,200 euros, and it's a kit. You assemble it yourself. Um, and that's, that's not as daunting as it may seem because you buy the packaged version like this one and at some point you end up disassembling the whole thing which I've done <laughs> and putting it back together so um, yes actually they have 3D printers which can almost print themselves minus the motors and some of the mechanical parts <coughs> and part of the, the a lot of the printers originally come from a project called the RepRap project. So this was one of the um, original RepRap models, which uses a Bowdoin tube style printer. And um, the idea with RepRap is to be able to create a device which can create itself, um, which is kind of cool. And theoretically, it's awesome. But um, practically, there's some mechanical aspects which are not quite solved. So you can't quite get self-producing robots yet. We'll, we'll get there in a few years. Um, OK. so. Do you guys know anything about 3D printing at all? Tad, a little light touch. What? You have four or three? Oh, OK. Experts. Expert. <laughs> so you guys can correct me when I screw up. <laughs> so um, <coughs> what, what sort of, what's, I'm curious what sort of printers you guys have. Okay, yeah. And did you build them yourselves? Or from kit or from entirely parted? The rest one just parts. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah, so they're, they're hardcore 3D printing specialists. Do you, do you, have you tried building a Bowdoin tube style printer? Yes. Oh, okay, very nice. Because these, these are supposed to be the fastest for head movements. Um, yeah, so th there's there's tricks with the filament. It's not easy to print flexible filaments, although I, I modified my printer so you can print flexible filaments. Um, and it, it works. <laughs> kind of. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's start from slightly more basics for people who have never, ever, ever tried this before. So this is an example of a, a print which didn't quite come out right. <laughs> it's under extruded in the center, as you can see. Here, pass this around. Um, and this one was done, the, the model was created in Maya, which is 3D software. Um, so John Yoon, the guy who does all of the Java X 3D stuff, he actually built this model for Java 1, and then we, we printed it out on the 3D printer. You can also create models using um, like Softworks or other professional 3D modeling tools. Um, you can use, um, what's the Google tool? SketchUp, which is free to create some simple models. Um, and you can also use code. So um, OpenSCAD is a common application you'll see lots of people create models in. And you can just write the code. And it's nice because you can change all the parameters. And I have a slight bias towards um, JCSG, which is a Java constructive geometry library. 
Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's like for doing circuits or stuff? Print a oh, printing a motor, motor. Yeah, so it's it's challenging to print metal parts. Mm -hmm. Like you'll see some metal prints, but it's usually a plastic print, which they powder coated with metal to give it a more of a. Yeah. So have you have you guys ever seen anyone try to print a full motor? Yeah. Okay, so use it as a mold to then create metal parts. Okay, so possible, but more steps. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but um, for the most part, you'll be printing stuff like, like this. So this, this actually is a, a model defined in Java code, and it's a Raspberry Pi case. So it has a little attachment point, so you can put a Raspberry Pi B+. Plus. And you can see that my printer is leaving little trails of plastic, possibly needs some tuning. <laughs> but it mostly works. Yeah, there's, yeah, so some trailing is normal, but um, you, can, you can adjust it using adjusting the temperature. So lower temperatures, you'll get less um, oozing. Yeah, um, but you have to print a little bit slower because you need more pressure to push the filament through. Um, and then sometimes it also has to do with the retraction, how far you're retracting the material. So this. This one uses a Bowden tube style. So there's a big tube here which the filament goes through. So the basic principle is um, you have a roll of, in this case, this is um, PLA, which is a corn-based plastic. Yeah, well, in several centuries. <laughs> but yeah, so this, this can't be recycled, but it can be biodegraded, but it takes quite a while um, and the right the right, um, um, yeah. Okay, so it varies quite a bit. Um, so if you if you buy an expensive roll like this from the manufacturer, they'll charge you a premium. But they they usually do a good job with the thickness of the material, getting a consistent thickness. Um, and I think these rolls costed me around thirty euros for however much this was. It doesn't say. But you know, one, one roll this size full. Um, you can also buy it from other folks. Like um, I bought some from ColorFab in the UK, and there's some other smaller manufacturers which make 3D filaments. There's a guy actually just um, in the Bay Area who does a lot of 3D filament. And you can get it, I think, for uh, 15 to 20 euros for a roll, about, if you get it from cheaper places. But then sometimes the, the thickness of the filament is less uniform. And for um, Bowden tube style printers, they're a little bit more picky about the thickness of the filament because you basically are putting pressure through the whole pipe. The extruder motor is in the back and it's pushing the filament. The head is light because there's no motor attached to the head. Most of the 3D printers you see have um, the extruder mounted on the head and it moves with the motor on the head. Oh, uh, colors. You, you don't. <laughs> yeah, so there's some attempts to, to have full color 3D printers or bicolor 3D printers. Let's see. So I have a few different rolls of filament I brought with me. Um, let's see, we got some green, purple, and white. So you can buy the filament in a variety of colors. 
you could probably custom order a different color if you wanted something very specific and you were ordering a large quantity. Um, theoretically, you can also like do white or some flat color and then paint it, although that's very tricky because the PLA doesn't paint very well. It's hard to get um, things to stick to it since it's so smooth. Um, so I think you have to like rough it up first. You have to rough up the surface and then you can, you can paint it. Um, and there's also some printers which claim to be dual extruders. Have you guys tried to do a dual extruder? How, what's your success, success been? Okay. So my, my buddy who does the Java Constructive Geometry Library in Germany, Michael Hoffer, or Michelle Hoffer, as I'm supposed to call him, something, something closer to that. Um, he actually um, modified his Ultimaker 1. The Ultimaker 1 has a dual extruder kit. So he modified it and he tweaked it. And he got it printing in two colors, but there's artifacts. So. Like, for example, he was, he was in um, Java Lands doing two color prints. And the first one came out pretty good. Just in between the layers, he printed a cone with a few different layers of colors. Um, in between the, the different layers of color, you could see slight, where the, it exited or entered, you see little splashes of the wrong color. Um, the second time he printed it, the head got slightly off alignment. So the, the layers were slightly skewed <laughs> with the different colors. Yeah, so that's one, one technique is having a dual extruder which has multiple heads to print. Um, another one is they have these devices which will splice different colors of filaments. So it feeds filament in and it chops up the filament at the right lengths. So you're using one head and you're just feeding in a continuous stream with different bands of colors. And that, I don't know, might work. Okay. White straws. <laughs> yeah, so Yeah, yeah. White is actually my favorite color to print, so. <laughs> yeah, so this is any color you want as long as it's one color. Um, oh, the other trick with 3D printing is it, it prints in layers and it, it builds up. So whenever you design a model, you need to be very careful about um, overhangs. So it will, it will happily print structures, like the, the Duke is hollow inside. And so it happily prints the perimeter of the Duke and it goes in a little circle around it. Um, but you notice his, his um, you know, under area, his, his little parts, they're a little bit droopy. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what happens when the, the 3D printer kind of has to bridge a gap and there's nothing below it to support the material, then you, you get little, um, you know, artifacts from the, the material oozing while it's still hot. Um, so you can make it across small spans and bridges. You can print about 45 degrees um, pretty reliably. This printer will probably get you to about, I don't know, what is that, 30 degrees? Reasonably. Um, depends on the printer how toler tolerant it is to inclines. Um, but if you end up with something which is like a perfect arc or curve, usually the top will be horrible, like this one. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's good enough. Um, and then if you, if you print something like this, where clearly uh, Michelle knew exactly what he was doing, he made sure there were no overhangs. <laughs> so this is specifically designed so you can even look at the little um, attachment points. He made sure it was exactly 45 degrees and nothing would, would need supports. Um, if you want to print a model which actually needs supports, you can do that. Um, and I'll show you the slicing software in a sec. But you can actually, in the slicing software, you can add in supports and then say, I want to have extra structures like built up. And then when it gets close to that, it'll print on top of those extra structures and you just break them off and throw them away. So you can add support structures to get around the limitation. 
um, the kind of the golden um, the uh, one of the, the things which people have been talking about is being like this this huge breakthrough if it ever actually works is the idea of using water soluble supports and this is why most people want dual extruders one head is for the color and one head is for the water soluble material which you'll then use to create a support grid that you can just wash away and then you'll be left with a perfect part um, that doesn't actually work in practice ever <laughs> so uh, Michelle was trying this but it, basically the issue with the water soluble material is it's a it's very hard to print with to begin with it requires a different temperature um, if it sits in the head too long it it burns and it gooks and it jams so um, in practice nobody's actually got it working reliably to the point where you could just give somebody a dual extruder printer with one head with the water soluble material and they would have beautiful prints it just doesn't exist um, but this makes it great fun for hobbyists because you can you can buy a printer you can build a printer you can modify a printer so this printer also has been enhanced it's um, slightly better than stock I would hope so this is a gratuitous cable guard which does nothing but give me peace of mind that my cable won't get jammed but this was this was actually printed on the 3d printer um, you can see a little chain little chain guard um, on the back of the printer let me make sure I don't unplug it by accident so on the, on the back of the printer originally the Ultimaker comes with just a an ABS um, plastic you know thing which sticks out and you stick the filament on but um, one of the guys posted built and posted the design for a proper um, spool holder with a bearing on it and the same guy also designed a completely new extruder so this is his extruder design and the the cool thing about his extruder is well one um, it actually lets the material flow through without any resistance which is important for this this particular model has a weak stepper motor so the Ultimaker original has a fairly strong motor here so strong that it will strip your plastic constantly <laughs> so what happens is you know this this little knurled gear here pushes the plastic up through the um, up through the printer and there's a fair amount of pressure you need to push the plastic through and occasionally it gets jammed and at that point no amount of pressure will get it through you're just never gonna get the plastic through so this knurled gear is designed so it'll step back um, so if it gets too much pressure it'll kind of flip back to offset a little bit um, and that's designed part of the motor design is so it only gets so much strength and then it clicks back so it doesn't um, grind the material on the original Ultimaker it will just grind your material happily and it has an even bigger motor so it's more powerful but um, this motor is not powerful enough to extrude at very fast rates so if there's any resistance in the flow either in the Bowden tube or the um, the extruder in the back then that means that you get under extrusion which is what happened to the center here where not enough materials flowing so this this replacement extruder solves that problem mostly um, this is supposed to also help so you have less drag on the material for pulling it so it's easier to pull and the other benefit of this guy is there's an extra piece I don't have here which lets you print flexible filaments so basically from the knurled gear up it's entirely co covered in a piece of plastic so if you have a flexible material they have a they sell a product called ninja flex which is kind of like a squishy rubber type thing and um, if you can imagine all the pressure through the pipe here on the filament if you have a flexible squishy filament um, it's not that happy and on the extruder which comes with the Ultimaker originally when you stick the Ninja Flex or something in here it will just in here it'll create a little it'll uh, turn into a little ball and then you're dead um, and then you spend like hours cleaning out the printer head because it's burned up there and then you have to like scrape it out and then it's a different temperature so the next thing you push through doesn't actually work and it's wonderful um, so that's that's what you spend your time in is y if you get it working usually the printer is like the, I've had good experience with the ones that they sell packaged actually come out of the box working which is good 
And then if you follow the instructions and don't cook it up too much, it'll work for a long time. And then at some point, something will fail. And you go on the forums, and they have quite an active user group community. And you'll find somebody who's posted or talked about it um, and has a recommendation. And they'll, you know, like for example, there's a really clever way to clean the head here called the atomic method, where you just open the back and you um, stick a piece of filament in, reduce the temperature, and you yank it out. And that pulls the gook out without actually having to soak the nozzle in um, acetone or something horrible. Um, so there's lots of little clever tricks they found in the community forum. Um, the reason why I like this printer, so we, in, the, in the demo team, we have some ultimate, we have some maker bots. Um, so we have a maker bot, uh, dual extruder, um, what's it called, ABS printer. And it, that one never works. <laughs> it's currently out of commission. The dual extruder's never worked on it since we got it. As a single extruder printer, it sometimes works, but the second extruder drags on the print and causes havoc. And then it jams up, and we have to send the parts back to MakerBot headquarters because you can't actually modify anything on it since it's all packaged and contained, and their support people always want you to ship things back to them. Um, so it's a Royal PETA, so we don't actually use that one that much. We have some Affinia printers, which is... They, they build large commercial printers, but they have a smaller one, which is... Um, a standard, like, Mendel-style printer. Um, and that one's actually fairly reliable, but it only prints the smallest feature it can print is 200 microns. Um, I think, I believe this model was printed at maybe 50 microns. I think that's what I set that one to. Um, this printer can go down to 30 microns as the smallest feature. Most of the MakerBots we have are 100 microns. What, what, do you, what are your printers typically set up? 60 micron, OK. Very nice. Um, this one, so th the number of microns is the layer height for each of the pancakes it makes. And so the, the thinner you get your layer height, it, it helps with two things. One is the model's smoother, because the layers are smaller and closer together. The other side effect is it's easier to print overhangs, because you have flatter pancakes you're stacking, so you can go sideways easier. Um, if you have really thick pancakes, when you go sideways, they um, don't print that well. Yeah, like a staircase. Um, so you can print it um, finer level of detail, but then it produces other problems because it pr takes longer to print, right? More layers, more time. Um, if your printer is not very happy, then printing slower speeds to get the layer height. Sometimes it'll be extruding too slowly and stuff doesn't happen, or it'll stop extruding. Um, so there's basically the finer the layer height, the more issues you run into with the printer actually being capable of printing. So I, I found this one's happy around like 50, 60. It performs well. I've done 30 micron prints, but sometimes um, stuff just doesn't work that should work when I get it down to 30 microns. Um, so it depends on the print. Um, the other nice thing about, um, well, OK, so the MakerBots, I, I hate them because they're a big evil corporation, which doesn't have an open design anymore. Um, they, they got bought by, uh, what's the big 3D printed company? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So say it again. Yeah, Stratus, Stratasys. Um, so they build huge printers, and they're just like eating up the little competitors. Um, the Affinia printers are nice workhorses, but they don't get fine enough features for what we need. Um, I was going to try to get a leapfrog to play around with it, but I think they're somewhat equivalent to the Ultimakers. And the Ultimakers, the nice thing about these guys is they're uh, open design. So you can actually download all the, the files for printing out the pieces and for all the machine parts that they build. And you could actually build the whole thing yourself if you, if you had time and energy. Or you could just buy the package one get on with it. OK, yeah, so yeah, so let's actually, just for fun, um, this will take slightly longer than the time we have. But um, I'll start another print. And this is a good chance to actually show the printer doing something. Um, so this is, this is a design. There's the one thing that 
everyone uses um, MakerBot for is their um, Thingiverse library of 3D prints. <laughs> That's kind of the, the go-to place for finding stuff to print. And um, one of the cool models is a um, herringbone gear. You've probably seen this before, where it has gears which are printed together and they, they mesh and they're permanently connected. Um, so the way, the way this one's done is, um, let me find in the list and get it started before I talk too much. So it, all of the models are on an SD card um, and you can transfer to the SD card um, and then print directly off the SD card because it has an Arduino running inside of it. You can also print from USB. There's a USB in the back, but that's not as reliable. Um, so I, sometimes I hook up a Raspberry Pi and then I have that send the print instructions. But if the queue ever gets to zero, like it runs out of data, um, your print is toast. So it's more reliable to actually have the memory locally so you don't get any interruption of your print. Um, you can, but restarting doesn't always work. <laughs> so yeah, you can, you can always pause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, the, the reason why this, this um, so what it's, what it's first going to do is it's going to um, heat the nozzle, heat the bed first, and then heat the nozzle. Um, and then it will extrude out some material to kind of flush it. And then it'll actually start the print. And before it starts the print, it'll print a ring around the outside just to make sure that it um, has the material flowing properly. And then it'll start in the actual model in the center. Um, what was I going to say? Ooh, 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 ooh. OK, I lost my train of thought from where I was going. OK. But I'm sure it was something really, really interesting, which I'll get to later. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I am. And we're going to walk back over to a computer which has software. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not speaking to any people of average intelligence, <laughs> but <laughs> Um, I would say for, for folks who don't have experience with 3D modeling but are just dabbling, you can get quite a bit done without too much hassle. But then um, the more complicated your design, the more the curve goes up. Yeah. So you can do fairly simple things without a lot of work. Um, they even have some programs for kids where you just draw like a 2D shape and it extrudes it and like a vase type thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's actually, um, I'm working on a workshop for DevOps for Kids where we can have a few 3D printers and have some simple software for, for kids can get started and um, do little models just to show what's possible with the printer and get them interested in possibly doing more on their, on their own time. Because it's, it's kind of a nice like exploratory thing. So I would say that <coughs> 3D printers are something which can consume a lot of time. <laughs> um, both creating models and tuning your printer and reading forums and learning more about the printer because you're curious like why things are working or why things aren't working. Usually why things aren't working is, is the reason why. Yeah, so it's going to attempt to print the outer circle first. Um, and my it looks like my bed is slightly too close. You can see the, um, the line is very flat. So I, I calibrated the bed slightly too close. I should probably have it slightly farther away. But it'll, it'll work. It'll be OK. There are some printers which claim to be able to auto calibrate the bed height. And they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not quite. Yeah. Yeah, so 
manual calibration tends to be the most reliable. Um, there's lots of printers which claim to do auto calibration, and our experience is they don't actually work. <laughs> so um, it, it typically tries to, to print boundaries first. And then the next thing it'll do is it'll print infill. Um, so it'll go through and it'll go back in and fill the areas between. And it, it kind of prioritizes the, the finished surfaces, so the, the edges, over the center. So it's, it's slightly more sloppy. The, the um, slicing software I'm going to show you. So, so the, the same Yeah, this, this follows the G code instructions. So what I have loaded on the SD card is G code, which is kind of like. Um, I think they also use G code for um, CDC and C machines. Same idea. And that's just basic instructions. Move here, arc here, um, you know, set this temperature, those sort of things. Um, OK, and you can see, yeah, OK, it's, it's doing fine. I, I was hoping it would mess up and I could point to it. But it's, it's not messed up yet. Oh, so um, the way the fans are set is it um, turns the fans on as it gets higher, up to about, um, I think, uh, 10 millimeters. They get to full fan height. And the, the reason is because you want to get better adhesion on the lower levels. So if you cool it down, it's going to cool the bottom layer quickly, and it'll peel up. So it lets it stick to the bed, and then as it gets higher, it will gradually turn the fans on slowly until it gets to full, full speed. Yeah. Okay. So, let me. Yeah. So, like, if you f if you feel that this is um the bed is heated, so you can actually touch it and it's yeah it's it's fairly hot. Um, and the reason for that is that's to <laughs> that's to get better adhesion with the material, because when the the PLA material is about I think the bed they keep the bed about eighty C is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, OK. So you want to keep the, the bed hot enough that the material is sticky. And then that makes it adhere very tightly to the bottom. Um, once the bed cools, and you'll see this at the end of the print if you're here when it ends, um, after it sits for about five minutes, there'll be a big <laughs> like a big crack. And when the bed cools, it, the material will actually pop off because it cools down and it, it um, it shrinks, shrinks slightly, and then it'll actually pop it off the bed. Um, so there's, there's some printers which don't have heated beds, and they'll try to use tape or something else to keep it down, like the blue painter's tape is a common way. But heated beds are they're easiest. <laughs> so getting a printer with a heated bed makes your life easier. Um, one without a heated bed, and your life is not as easy. Difficult. Um, what? A wood bed for nylon. I haven't tried printing nylon. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so if you want to print a weapon which takes half an hour to load, and after the first shot will be destroyed itself, <laughs> then yes, you can, you can print a weapon on the 3D printer. <laughs> um, so they also they give you glue with the printer as well. Um, not this glue. They give you like white glue. But the purple glue is better. But you don't need glue. Pretty much almost never need glue if you have a heated bed. Um, even the 3D Duke I printed, it has very small contact points. And normally, normally you'd think you'd need glue to keep it on. But it's enough surface area where he'll stick properly. Um, so there's a few models I use glue because they don't adhere well for some weird reason. But by and large, you can get by without actually using glue. And this is the easiest way to destroy your printer. Put a nice thick layer of glue, let it swish around with the head, and then it'll glue up the nozzle, and you're dead. Well, there, there's um, lots of failure scenarios. <laughs> so, so it's like this process where you, you, you make all these mistakes. <laughs> Or you, re you read about the mistakes in the forum sometimes, but usually you make them yourself. <laughs> and then you figure out, oh, this is what I did wrong. I, I, like, like, for example, um, when I first got the printer, I um, 
was loading or I was unloading the printer. And it takes a while to heat up the nozzle. It takes a while for the material to go out. I said, right, I'll go do something else. I'll come back in you know, 10 minutes. Half an hour later, I come back. And I'm like, oh, I'm ready to load up my material. And it was, it was stuck. It wouldn't work. I'm like, what happens? And so inside the nozzle, in the period of time I left it, it was full temperature because it was, it was you know, high temperature to take the material and put the material in. It had cooked the material inside the head. And it was permanently gooked up. Like I had to use the uh, atomic method to clear it. So there's there's lots of little ways to jam your printer and destroy it. I mean, fortunately, most of them are non are reversible. You can actually fix it, especially on something you can take apart yourself and deal with. On something which is like packaged, like the MakerBot, you're you know send it back. <laughs> okay, let's look at software. If you guys are. Yeah. Oh, that's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that, but it's probably around 500 for that model. Yeah, probably. It'll be. Well, you can tell this this guy thinks it's going to be 18 hours before our print is done. So, <laughs> this 3D printers are not quick. Yeah, they're not fast. The the Duke, the Duke model, the Duke model is quick, <laughs> but most most models are not so quick. Okay, so I have I have software up on the screen for us to look at. So we're gonna go we're gonna go backwards through this process. Um, so this this software is one of a few different slicers that you can use, and this answers um, the question about how do you actually create the G code that you need to print a model, um, and basically this will allow you to load up. Um, any sort of STL file. So I think this is this is the Raspberry Pi mount that you know you guys were taking a look at. And um, the way this works is you can um, you know obviously this this one's not going to print very well. It has lots of overhangs in this orientation, but we can rotate it perhaps um, if I remember how to use this. Yeah, so if you click on the overhang button here, and if we can figure out the right button for this. Um, wait, wait. OK. Let me reload that. Uh, OK, there we can see, see all those red areas? So those are areas where it says, no, 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 that won't print. Um, well, it did print, but not upside down. So, so oh, I, I remember you click on the model, and then we can rotate it. Okay, rotate. So put it automatically figure out Um, so it has a lay flat thing, which will help us slightly, but it doesn't know how to flip things upside down. But once we get the right orientation, then we can tell it to um, lay it flat, and it'll it'll stick it flat on the bed. And that should print somewhat more successfully. Um, now, once we once we get it there, we can also look at the the layers. Um, so this actually lets us view the individual layers as it prints up. And the blue line is the the you know the path the print head will go. And then you can see the individual layers here. So the first few layers are solid, right? Um, once you get to the center here, it just prints a crosshatch pattern. So this is the infill to give it a little bit of structure. And then once it gets here, it, um, this prints the top, and this prints the pillars. Do, do, do. Were they not solid? No, this, this guy, most of the models, 
I print are hollow. It conserves material and it prints faster. Um, solid models would be stronger. But this is, yeah, this is good enough. Really? Oh, because, yeah, yeah. So the layers will separate on full infill. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the weak points in models are usually the gaps between the layers where the plastic adheres. Um, so if you put stress on a, like a long, a long tall thing, will crack, whereas like a wide one will bend. Um, so I guess the infill actually is stronger. I'm learning something new today. Um, okay, so this is the, the slicer software. So you load STL files in this, and then you give it some parameters for the printer. Um, and then you can you can save G code and export it to the printer. Um, I would recommend just you know grabbing the USB stick, not while it's printing, obviously. Um, loading it up and then copying your model onto the the stick, and then you can go ahead and press print on the printer. Um, and then to actually get a model, there's a few different ways you can get um, models. So of course the the quick and easy one is if you had internet connection, you would go to Thingiverse. Um, let's get internet connection. Boop, boop, ba -doo. I'm not even going to try the conference Wi-Fi. We're just going to tether it because I don't need to do much. <coughs> Do any of these Wi-Fi networks work reliably today, or? Yeah, OK, we're on. Yeah, I could, but um. We just need to load the website so you guys can see. OK, so anyway, this is the, the Thingiverse website once, once it loads. I, I, ha I supposedly have a 3G connection. And then the, the other way of creating models, models is um, something, something I've been using for some of the stuff I'm writing on the book is Fusion 360. So um, like SolidWorks is what a lot of professionals use for creating 3D models. Um, Autodesk has a competitive product called Fusion 360. And it's, it's free for startups and hobbyists. Um, so it's a good way to get started and has most of what you need to create really complex models with um, it'll let you precisely specify like sizes of things and um, um, get precise tolerances on, on parts if you're building mechanical parts or gears. Um, okay, let's see. Thingiverse came up. Okay, so featured item of the day is a, a bicycle. <laughs> but yeah, there's just there's just a huge collection of, of stuff. So you can print parts to. It's the world's most expensive bicycle. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> no, nothing that you can print yourself will be more cost effective than if you went <laughs> in a in a dollar store and bought it. Um, so 3D printing is unique because you can build things which like, you know, there's a unique puzzle there, um, boomerang, some sort of hypercube, parametric hypercube. So there's lots of cool like mechanical things you can build, mathematical stuff you can build. Um, so anyway, what most people do when they first get a 3D printer, they go on Thingiverse, they find some cool models just to test it out and to see what the limits of the printer are, make sure your printer is properly calibrated, um, have some fun. And then you're like, well, I want to build my own models. OK, so um, Fusion 360 is fairly good if, if you can actually get on it. SketchUp is good, too, and that's free, even for commercial stuff. Wow, well, OK. And what is it? It's free for startups. How do they define startups? Long people's money. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, that describes most of us. Wow, it won't copy and paste. That's pretty evil. Okay, well, since I am on a live stream, I probably have to turn off the live stream just for a sec. Oh my god, I can't, there's no possible way I can copy, I can type that either. I have a huge... Okay, so I'll deal with this later. Just trust me that, you know, it's, it's a reasonable program for doing 3D. Okay, but the really cool one for doing 3D, the one which, you know, I think is, is most interesting is, of course, using um, OpenSCAD, which, um, let's see if I can actually have a copy of it here. Gradle. So actually, I have the repo checked out. Um, I may actually have a working version, perhaps, on my machine. Ah, OK. So <laughs> this is um, actually written in JavaFX. And it on the left side is um, code. So it's a Java library for specifying your model. And on the right side is a visualization using JavaFX 3D of what that um, item which you're printing would look like. Um, so this is an open source project that Michael Michelle Hoffer is working on. Um, like for example, this is a simple cube with a sphere subtracted from it. So if we make the sphere smaller, what will happen? Just see a cube. Yeah, okay. So at some point, it will just be a cube. Right, so now it's it's the sphere is subtracted, but it's entirely inside of it. Um, at at different levels, we actually see, you know, it'll slightly protrude, but it'll be smaller inside of it. Um, and you know, that's a very simple example. But the the code for the board mount is here, so it's not much code. It defines uh, the pegs, and it reuses the pegs at different points around the model. Um, defines the board, and um, you know, this is all Java code, which, you know, looking at a few samples, you could probably figure out the entire syntax and, you know, build your own models. It's not all that complicated. Um, let's see. So this, this was actually um, his design for a robot. So this is a clip that attaches to the board, so you can put a battery holder on it. So it's kind of a modular design where you kind of snap these components together. Um, so that was the battery holder piece. This is the one that holds the servo motor. And um, he has the wheels as well for the robot. If I can get to it, wheel, wheel. OK, so that's the wheel design for the robots. You can have a few wheels. And these wheels are designed so you can basically stick them on um, normal servo, servo mounts. And then you can actually have a little robot driven directly off of servos, and then have a, a breadboard and a Raspberry Pi directly you know, piled on top of it. And all this, you know. Java code, easy to modify. Like when the Raspberry Pi B Plus came out, it took him like a day to just modify the, the pin attachment points, and he sent me a new version. And I printed it out on my printer, and I had a Raspberry Pi B Plus so um, so case. So it's a day quick. What? No, well, OK, so the, the model I'm printing now is bigger. You'll see when it comes out. Um, most of these models will print in under an hour. Oh, his his day for modifying it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was that was that was the time difference turnaround <laughs> between me bugging him and then him emailing me back the the model, which it probably took him like ten minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it wasn't that complicated. I mean, he had to pull, probably pull out a caliper and measure measure the right distances, but that's about it. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so I think the, the Java, JavaFX JCSG library is really cool. I would recommend trying that. Let me pop up the website for that. Uh, JCSG. Um, and it's all open source code on GitHub. Um, so you can download it and modify it. Um, apparently hasn't made it the top. 
search rankings on Google yet, but add Java and you're there. Um, and he has a bunch of sample models checked in, so you can try his sample models and then also modify them and, and make your own cool stuff. So what do you guys use mostly for your 3D models that you use? OpenSCAD? OK. So you're actually doing the programmer way. <laughs> That's the right way of doing it, I think, for especially for us. OK, so this is the GitHub repo. Um, some samples, and then the um, JFX SCAD application. So JFX SCAD is the visual UI, which is it's a separate GitHub project, but it, it uses the same JCSG library. OK, so that was your lightning tour of 3D printing for um, hackers. So you guys ready to get started? Yeah? 